Hey, everybody. Can y'all see me okay? <clears throat> so, um, hi. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm on Wurundjeri land here, um, unceded so sovereign territory of the people of Kulin Nation. Um, I want to acknowledge elders past and present. Um, any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people here today, hi. Um, all of you, thank you for coming and giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Friday mornings are Friday mornings. So I'm I'm really thankful for your time. Thank you. Um, just a conclusion, if you decide you like need to go to the toilet or something while I'm talking, um, resilience is propaganda. It's not your fault. Um, it, it, it's fine. Don't, don't stress out about being the change you want to be in the world. Don't stress out about thinking global and acting lo local. It's all, it's propaganda and we'll be fine. Um, let, let's begin with a, with like a sneaky, sneaky bit of zoom action. Um, what I would love you to all do real quick for me is if you click like on your, on your own face, the little like dot, dot, dot in the top right, um, you can go rename and rename yourself and just rename yourself to like your first name and then your mood. Uh, just so I can kind of see what's what's the vibe. For example, I'm honestly kind of sleepy because I played video games real late last night and that's my vibe. Um, and while you're doing that, let me just explain what we're about to do. Um, we're gonna do like a real quick Zoom storm. Uh, what this means is I'm gonna ask you a question and you're all gonna like type the answer and then put up your hands so that I can see that you've finished typing. And then when everybody is typed, we're all gonna hit enter at the same time so that we get like 50 answers to my question all at once, which means you can hide your embarrassing answer within the flood of everyone else's. We don't have to feel weird. Um, let, let's start, let's start with this one. Question the first, what did you have for breakfast? Type, 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 hands up, don't hit enter, don't hit enter, hands up when you're done. You're doing great. Those of you with cameras on, I can see. Okay, excellent. Three, two, one, enter. Holy moly. Makes me very happy to see other people only having coffee for breakfast. Thank you. Okay, so resilience. Let's let's get excitable. Uh, <laughs> question the second. What are you doing about your carbon footprint? Hands up when you're done. Take take your time. That's almost everybody. Three, two, one, hit it. Just having a look. All right, more virtual work, less planes, riding a bike. Not enough donations to charity, naughty, naughty. Not consuming more than you need. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, being a conscious consumer, cool. Question the third. How has COVID changed your recycling habits? Type, 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 hands up when you're done. Oh, Belinda, early on the enter. Peter, early on the enter. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Three, two, one, enter. Don't worry, there's always like one or two to get it wrong. It's fine. All right, question the fourth. More recycling, great, same as before, cool. Question the fourth is, why does resilience matter to you personally? Type, 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 hands up when you're done. So cool to see like 50 answers at once, by the way. Thank you. All right, three, two, one, enter. Not being crushed. <laughs> That's so grim. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you everybody for doing that. Um, it's so interesting to see how people feel about this stuff. Um, yeah, just fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time to scroll through them and just like get a read. I, I would recommend you do the same. 
we can just kind of see what we collectively think and feel about this stuff right now. And that's, that's fascinating. Um, so unsurprisingly to some of you, these were all kind of like trick questions. Um, uh, they're all an individualized frame of resilience as though the entire fault of all of the world's ills is up to you and you alone to fix. Uh, to explain this, let me, let me tell you like an apocryphal story. Um, this is not a true story. This is just an example. Um, imagine, if you will, there's like a, a mountain, right? And this mountain has a river that flows down with crystal clear waters. And this river nourishes like a, a small town, you know, like a, a small town full of people that live nearby and they, they like swim in the river and they wash their clothes and they, they drink the water and water as is its wont nourishes life, right? Now, one morning while the kids are like playing in the river and stuff, a body floats down the river, a, de a dead body, like a distended bloated corpse. And the blood is full of excrement and blood. And the parents tell their kids, you got to get out of the water. That's, that's really intense. Like, oh, we don't know what's going on. Why is there a body in the river? Next morning, another body floats down the river and the community decides to do something about it. So what they do is they start boiling water in their homes. They tell their kids to only uh, swim in the afternoon. One like plucky person creates a pool for people to like swim in, you know, with chlorine and it's all clean and stuff so they don't have to swim in the waters. Um, and before long, the like water cleanliness system has turned into like a great big factory that cleans the water for the entire community. Uh, and there's like, there's pools, you know, everywhere. Lots of people have pools because swimming is like a really important thing for this community. And so we've got like a, a, a whole community of people who have very resiliently managed the problem of bodies floating down the river every morning. Uh, at some point, some like, you know, plucky young entrepreneur comes along and says like, hey, this like big centralized water purification, this is, this is undemocratic. You know, this is terrible. We need to start a startup, right? I'm a social entrepreneur. I can fix this. I'm going to disintermediate this. I'm going to distribute it. We're going to democratize access to water cleanliness. And we're going to put a little teeny tiny water purifier in every single house so that it's decentralized and everybody can control their own destiny, re clean water. And another clever person sees all the pools around and realizes that like some people don't have pools and some people do. And so we're going to do some kind of like pool sharing, like an app where you can like use one another's pools. If you don't have one, you can like lease access to your pool if you do, like air pool or whatever they call it. And finally, at some point, one plucky activist, she comes along to everybody and she says like, hey, I have this idea. What if we went up the mountain and we like went on a little hike and we found who was dropping bodies in the water? What if we did that? At which point the owner of this factory, the owner of the pool distribution network say, are you crazy? Be resilient. Look at reality as it is and deal with it. You need to be resilient to the problems that are in your life. This is not gonna do anything. And this resilience is the propaganda we're gonna talk about today. The reason that I explain this with my really terrible, terrible drawings is that there's two words I want you to kind of like put in your head. Upstream, which in this case is literally the top of the stream, the source where there are like bodies going in the river and downstream, namely everything else that happens later. We have upstream causes and downstream effects. Uh, the reason that I kind of like to use this story to explain this is that upstream and downstream, when we're talking about like social or technical or political problems is often like real fuzzy and real hard for us to understand. Uh, that's partially because the propaganda has worked. Um, 
by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna like pause every now and then and just like ask you to all type some stuff so we can like see how you're feeling. Um, feel free to do this like constantly, and I'll like keep an eye on the chat and and answer questions as we go. Um, this is super informal. I have a vague plan that we can bail on at any time. So please feel free to type questions and stuff. Um, so yeah, resilience. Resilience is like a really it's a really tricky way of understanding how social change and social structures work. Um, let me give you some examples that that will make things a little easier. So let me screen share real quick. Yeah, rad. So resilience. Um, by the way, this like a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is just straight up stolen from a book. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to be released soon. Like I have no original thought. Deviousframes.com, get the book. It's going to be amazing. I, I earn no money from any of this. It's just really good. So resilience. Um, as I've said, you are not personally responsible. Anybody that tells you you are is spouting propaganda. Examples, recycling. Um, I'm going to go through these real quick so that we can just like have a yarn about it. Um, recycling isn't like an actual straight up scam. And I'm going to give you all access to like my notes and this slide so you can click links <laughs> to all of these things. Um, there's a great video by a mob called Climate Town um, who just have a wonderful video. You should go and watch it. I'm not going to just repeat everything he says, but the short version is this symbol in the top left with the one on it is a resin identification code. The thing down the bottom is a recycling label. It's like 10% of plastic can actually be recycled. Making you feel bad about recycling is a great distraction from corporations producing giant thundering tons of plastic. Producing plastic is the upstream cause. Recycling is one of many distractions downstream from that production. Similar to littering. Um, yeah, this is in 1971, this is like a real American thing. In fact, a lot of the propaganda we get is from America and we just get like the Australianized version of it. Um, 1971, this like weird set of ads came out in America. Uh, this, my apologies to use the parlance of the time, um, native American Indian who is actually an Italian dude, like an Italian dude in makeup and a wig would get on ads, look at litter and cry. Like that was the whole ad. Uh, and it was really well orchestrated to distract from pollution done by corporations. Um, really, really good way to make people feel like it's up to them to pick up litter. You, you see like the modern version of this is like those uh, like images that you see on like social media often where there's like a really messy beach and then there's like some dude with a bunch of garbage bags on a clean beach, you know, kind of championing the idea of an individual hero fixing litter and it makes its way into law and we get fined for littering. Uh, we're starting easy, by the way, this is the easy stuff. Jaywalking, this, this is like, I think this is what a lot of people think of when they think of propaganda. We think of propaganda as a thing that happened during wars in the past, like the twenties. So this is just literally the first images I could Google about jaywalking. Um, you know, <laughs> this is this hilarious like 1920s, <laughs> I wonder if this thing is loaded. A child walking across the street is similar to a gun at the head, you know? <laughs> like we think of these like really old fashioned uh, people using roads is bad kind of vibe is what jaywalking is. But the modern version of this is that almost all like, almost all public land is corrupted through roads. Um, we kind of think of roads as a thing we have to have. Um, and the auto lobby is really good at convincing politicians, citizens, and everybody that roads are desperately important. But I, like one way of thinking about this is that anytime, I don't know, like the Victorian government uh, gets all pumped up about like a billion dollar road project, we think of that as like a billion dollar investment in the public good, right? But the, like the weird thing about that when you actually think it through is like a billion dollar road is a thing that can only ever be used by cars. There's nothing else you can do on a road other than drive a car on it. Um, you're fined if you try and do anything else on it. So that billion dollar road really is a billion dollar subsidy to auto manufacturers. It makes the cars that you drive on there cheaper. It effectively forces you to travel farther, um, which is also a zoning issue. And Melbourne has some of the worst zoning issues ever, which is why we're so sprawly. Um, but yeah, roads, roads are use of public land, stolen public land. 
uh, in a way that basically only benefits auto manufacturers. So speaking of cars, our carbon footprint. This is a question I asked you before. How do you feel about your carbon footprint? We now feel about our carbon footprints because the propaganda worked. Uh, Pre-2005, carbon footprint was like maybe a, like a vague academic term that nobody ever used, but BP came along and did like a $250 million campaign with Ogilvy uh, to make sure everybody understood the idea of a climate uh, having a carbon footprint. Um, there's literally, you can go and look up the ad if you want. It's like a, a Vox pop with people in the street. Um, and they're saying like, no, I don't know what my carbon footprint is. And they're like, well, let me tell you what your carbon footprint is. This is the same BP, by the way, that like spent a huge amount of money on a rebranding to be, was it Beyond Petroleum or whatever now? This is called the Helios logo, um, which is basically BP spending more money on rebranding about like suns and flowers and stuff than they actually spend on anything to do with renewables in their actual budgets. Total scam, tremendously evil. Um, financial literacy, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get closer and closer to home um, with this. So financial literacy, this is like, you know, the idea of teaching people to manage their budgets so that they can have more money to spend on stuff or, uh, when it gets real scary, like um, going to like developing countries and spending lots and lots of philanthropic dollars teaching people to manage their budgets. You know, this guy lifting his his money weights, his powerful money weights. Um, and this, it just doesn't work. It's like there's really good data to show that it's like 0.1% outcomes on families that are given financial literacy training. It's a great way to basically blame poor people for being poor while using philanthropic dollars to make philanthropists look better. It just doesn't work. Uh, similar to mindfulness, again, there's like links so you can go and read the detail on it. I'm just gonna skim over the top. Uh, yeah, mindfulness, again, no, no useful population level outcomes. Uh, I just Googled like mindfulness real quick before this talk and found this hilarious image. I'm really sorry if anybody knows who this guy is, but I just found this wonderful. Wonderful and hilarious. Grit, let's talk about grit. So now we're getting towards actual like resilience in the term as it's used by Sheryl Sandberg and that terrifying book that was mentioned at the start of the talk. So grit, you know, this is like the whole, um, what's her name, Angela Duckworth thing of like, if you're tough minded and smart and you can bounce back, blah, 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 blah. A lot of this goes back to this like old marshmallow test. You probably remember this, right? It's like the idea that you, get some kids and you lock them in a room and you give them a marshmallow and you say, if you don't eat the marshmallow, you can have two marshmallows later. And the research found that kids that had the grit, the gumption, the stick to to not eat the first marshmallow and wait for the second marshmallow had amazing outcomes later in life. You know, they were richer, happier, blah, 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 blah. So the correlation between the two was that if you have great self-control, you'll live a happy, wonderful life. But when the study was replicated with 10 times the people later, it turned out that it's just rich kids aren't as hungry and they don't feel the need to grab food whenever it's put in front of them. So they don't need it and they've got marshmallows at home and they're fine. I like to think of this as like hor horsey healthcare. Women that own horses live longer. This is a proven fact. It's not because horses make you live longer. It's because if your family can afford stables, you can afford to live a really long, healthy life. <laughs> Um, so yeah, resilience, it's propaganda. Um, we've got some studies and stuff you can read if you're interested. Um, there's like a whole bunch of links and stuff. Um, in fact, let me, let me show you real quick. I've, I'm going to give you a link to this in the chat. And we also have like a whole bunch of notes. It's just like random links to stuff that you can read, which I would recommend doing, by the way. Um, I feel like the best way to navigate this stuff in my experience is just to like start a book club, <laughs> like get together with a bunch of friends, get one of the books that's like a bit of a slog <laughs> from a list like this and just read it together. Um, so yeah, that's like a really brief overview of resilience and propaganda. I, I think like once you start to kind of like uh, sense the behaviors of it, so not the behaviors, the like the patterns of it, i.e. we take a really big, generally population level social issue like fossil fuels, obesity, like you name it, um, car usage. And the propaganda works when we feel individually accountable for that problem. Think global, act local. 
Like, what a crazy idea. Think global, act global through global institutions. Think local, act local. Uh, it's like proportional response. Um, let me just pause because that might have been kind of intense. Um, questions? Thoughts? What, what if this feels uncomfortable or what if this feels like, I don't know, when I first started diving into this stuff, I was like, man, a lot of the work that I have done with the best of intentions in the past, not only has not worked, but has gotten in the way of actual change, like terrifying. Thank you so much, Will. I um, I have a question to kick us off. And yeah, yeah I can see things coming through the chat, people saying, mind blown, Totally. That's why we use that emoji in the event description. <laughs> I had a feeling that's how we'd be feeling. So my question, I guess, is how do we how do we feel personally empowered if this is true and and our um, individual action is not actually having the intended effect? How do we still sort of go about our lives feeling like we have any control over the world around us i think that's that's such such a hard one and you've kind of nailed you've nailed why thinking in a different way about things that previously went unquestioned is very very hard for almost everybody it's sort of like we are individuals we think about ourselves as individuals with almost everything so it's very natural for us to think about all of these things as something that we have to be an individual about um uh, the author of the book that i recommend um talks about this as like developing your population intuition you know, it's kind of a thing that most people don't really have. We don't really have an intuition on how populations work and how population level effects work. Um, so I think like, honestly, just like taking time is really good. Um, you know, it's sort of like we don't fix capitalism by doing more, harder, faster, more violent capitalism. Um, kind of got to slow down <laughs> and give some room. Um, and in fact, like maybe just giving up on a lot of the kind of personal accountability that we have for like big change um, <laughs> is a really good way to start. Just lit up, like throw your recycling in the trash for a week and use the brain space to talk to your friends about how you feel about it. You know, I think like the, the, the interesting thing about pro this kind of propaganda working is that it atomizes people. You know, we, do, we don't really think about ourselves as uh, collectives of people in structured groups like unions, um, and civil rights organizations. We don't, we don't think about that so much. We think about ourselves as users in a system, like really, really flat, um, which is horrifically disempowering. So just taking a bit of time to like hang out with people in your community or your friendship group and talk and not really worry about your personal accountability for all of it, I think is actually a really good step. Um, and yeah, just read the stuff that we've got in the notes. <laughs> um, there are a few questions yeah. coming through in the chat there, Will. So Andrew's got a good one. Do you think it's still helpful to have resilient skills in order to be an activist on global slash population issues? That is such a good question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I mean, I would like I would like us to work so that activists don't have to be resilient because that uh, if you have to be a powerful, resilient person to be an activist, then only a certain kind of person becomes an activist and we only get the results that that kind of person can manage. So I would actually say, God, that's such a good question. Should activists be resilient? I, what I think is really interesting is that the frame of that question is still about the individual. Maybe a better question is, what can organized groups of people do that doesn't rely on any one of them being resilient to change the structures that define the conditions of their labor? Um, I actually think like Mike Montero is a is like a cool guy if we're thinking of creating more mornings to to go and look up. Um, his talk, Fuck You Pay Me, um, and uh, his books are, are a really good start for like there's a lot of designer creative in a North Melbourne types in here. Um, just getting paid for your labor is real good. Join a union. Um, <laughs> um, 
I'm going I'm to look at the more questions. So how do we reconcile getting nastied by global companies with actually getting by day to day and doing something? Again, I think it's really interesting, right? The propaganda works. We think about this as something that we have to do something about ourselves. Um, if I'm to think about like what actually works as compared to taking on personal responsibility about this stuff, um, I think the simple thing is like, just stop working on downstream solutions to upstream problems. Um, I find this really difficult to think about as somebody who spent, you know, 80 hours a week, a decade of my life running a social impact B Corp tech company, not convinced it really did anything good at the end of the day. Um, but my Lord, was I busy doing that work? You know, so it's like every hour you wrestle away from doing meaningful work um, is time that you can relax, change your headspace and start to think about and read about and work on um, larger problems in structured groups of people. Um, yeah, book clubs, incredible. What book are you reading at the moment, Will? Uh, <laughs> at the moment, I'm reading like really low quality science fiction. <laughs> Uh, that I wouldn't recommend. Um, but let me actually, let me screen share real quick. Um, we've, I'm just going to like show you the doc that we'll link you all to, because um, this is much more useful than than listening to me talk. Um, by the way, in the in these slides, uh, we, there's more that we could go through if we really wanted to about like what propaganda is and how it works. Um, but you can also just read, like you can just read this stuff. There's there's some books here. Again, sign up for Grant's book, DeviousFrames.com. It's going to be incredible when it's released. Um, watch these videos by Climate Town. They're just fantastic. Um, Charming Psychopaths is a great book to read. My personal favorite actually is Strategy of Preventative Medicine. It's not, it's not about propaganda. It's just more about how um, population level medicine works. Um, and it's just a really good primer for getting your head out of groups of individuals doing good work and into how to bell curves on populations actually function. So I'd, I'd start there. Oh my God, sorry, I'm just, I'm seeing in the chat here. Here in Brazil, there are people that actually believe that poor people are poor because they are financially illiterate. Um, do you know what, I'm just, I don't want to like, I don't want to call it out too hard, but this like option B stuff that we heard about at the start, I was like Googling it while you were talking about it. It's terrifying, just terrifying. So I'm going to, I'm going to screen share again, just so that we can, I, I feel like there's a really cool thing you can do in just like learning to spot this stuff in the wild so that you don't feel so like bad about it all. Um, this plan B, right? This is this like, sorry, option B. This is this option B resilience stuff. So this is Sheryl Sandberg, right? Sheryl Sandberg wrote Lean In, which is just like straight up propaganda, blaming women for the structures that stop them from getting into positions of power, like terrifying. Like when we look at this plan B stuff, it's like individual resources so that individual humans can like, I don't know, like self-confidence and self-compassion. It's like you can't self-confidence and self-compassion yourself like, out of a deunionized job or like, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like in Australia, it's like a lot of it, it's John Howard and work choices and privatizing public industry. It's like, you can't resilience your way out of those things. So maybe, maybe the first step is just like spotting this stuff in the wild when you see it and calling it out for what it is and then forgetting about it and doing something else. I think, I think there's a real bias for people to want to do something you know, it's like we want to we want to add our personal value into the world. And maybe instead of that, we can just not do the bad things. Um, and I think that the simple answer here is just getting rid of subsidy for bad things. You know, we subsidize sugar globally to a greater figure than we subsidize all education. Um, I, like in Australia, for example, with roads, I'm pretty sure the per person fossil fuel subsidy amount is like twelve hundred bucks. Also at the moment, so like even if you don't have a car, you don't use plastic ever, you're still subsidizing fossil fuels in Australia, 1200 bucks a year. Like that's not a small amount added up. So it's sort of like your personal efforts don't change those structural elements, the vast majority of them being uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, sugar, 
auto companies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in Australia, we have a really big issue with um, zoning. You know, half a million dollars of the average Melbourne or Sydney property is really just down to zoning. Um, the Melbourne mayor is a property developer. <laughs> like it's nuts. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, personal responsibility doesn't change any of that. Um, is, it, is it breakout room time? I've rambled for ages. How about yeah. I shut up? <laughs> Thank you so, so much. And it's so funny as I was just sort of, I was going to ask you like, what's what's one thing we can do or one thing we can take away just as you were saying, don't do anything. <laughs> just don't do the bad thing. And I think that's um, that's a pretty great place to leave it. So thank you so, so much. Um, we will get these resources um, that Will mentioned out to you all. I'm also going to send a copy of the chat to everyone who was here so we can get um, everyone's recommendations from the start of the session, as well as all of this great stuff from Will. He's popping the links in there for us now. Um, Will, you um, thank you so incredibly much for your, your generosity and your smarts and your wisdom today. We are going to pop everyone out into breakout rooms now, including Will. So if you've got some burning questions for him, um, hopefully you end up in his room. Um, otherwise, Thank you so much for being here today on a Friday morning, on a cold morning, on the first morning of our fourth lockdown. Um, wishing you all a really great weekend ahead and um, hoping that you all stay safe and happy out there. Have a lovely time in breakout rooms or a lovely weekend ahead.